In this video we're going to go ahead and introduce futures contracts. Let's go ahead and start with a definition. A futures contract is an agreement to purchase or sell an asset at a later date for a price set today and that price set today is the current price of the futures contract in the market. Now, an example might be going long or purchasing the futures contract. If you go long, you're agreeing to take delivery of the underlying asset. You're trying to purchase that underlying asset at a later date. The later date is the maturity date or expiration date for the contract. And the price set today is whatever the current market price is in the futures market for that asset. So for example, if I decide to buy a wheat futures contract, then I'm agreeing to take delivery of bushels of wheat at expiration date for whatever price I purchase those contracts at in the futures markets today. If I go short a wheat futures contract, now I'm agreeing to sell or deliver the underlying asset at the maturity date of the contract for the price set to date. So if you go long, you're trying to take delivery. If you go short, you're agreeing to deliver that underlying asset. Now, a quick comment on the idea of delivery. When futures contracts were started out, typically they were used for commodities, especially grains. And the idea is that the person purchasing the futures contract actually wanted to take delivery and the person that was selling the futures contract wanted to sell their product. However, in many cases today, there's a lot of speculators in the futures markets who may not want to actually take delivery. For example, I might decide to buy a corn contract because I think the price of corn is going up. But one corn contract is for 5,000 bushels of corn. I don't really want 5,000 bushels of corn delivered to my house, so I'm not planning to take delivery of the underlying asset. So in that case, what I would do to avoid delivery is if I purchase that contract today, I would make sure I sold that contract sometime before expiration, and that would cancel out my obligation to take delivery. The key is I'd have to sell it at whatever the current market price is. If corn went up, like I hoped, I'd make a profit. If corn went down, I'd end up losing money. Also, another issue that affects delivery is, as I mentioned, when futures contracts originated, most of them were on various commodities. However, now we have contracts on weather. I can't deliver somebody the weather, so instead those are cash settled contracts. So many different types of contracts, including stock index futures, are not actually set up to deliver an underlying asset, but instead are cash settled. So delivery may or may not occur in the futures market. Some contracts are set up for delivery. If you don't want to deliver the underlying asset or you don't want to take delivery, then you need to reverse your position, close out your position prior to expiration. Other contracts are set up so that there is no delivery. I mentioned a few of these types of contracts already but futures markets right now there are several different types of contracts for instance equity index contracts you can buy futures on the s p 500 you can buy futures on the dow jones industrial average you can buy a futures contract on the nikkei average lots of different equity index is have futures markets available to trade on them there are several different interest rate futures. You can buy interest rate futures on treasury bonds, treasury bills, euro dollar accounts. Lots of different types of contracts are tied to interest rates. Grains, which we mentioned already, corn and wheat were some of the earlier types of futures markets. Livestock like cattle and pork bellies. Precious metals. As I'm filming this, precious metals are actually a pretty popular futures contract. There's been lots of interest in gold over the last few years, so gold futures are pretty heavily traded. Energy over the last several years has been a very popular contract. There's oil futures, there's the Arbob gasoline futures, where you can buy or sell futures on unleaded gasoline. And there are many other types of futures contracts out there. 
um, coffee futures. There's weather futures, which I've mentioned. There's futures on real estate indices. So all kinds of different contracts that have been created essentially to set a underlying asset and that underlying asset may not be a physical asset but a structured asset for instance in the weather contracts the delivery or the value of the contract is based on different things like heating degree days or cooling degree days there's not an actual asset there but instead a way to calculate the value of the futures contract at expiration Now a few key terms when we get into talking about futures. One of the first that I want to talk about is the idea of performance bonds are sometimes referred to as margins. Actually more often you'll hear people refer to them as margin contracts. The exchanges tend to refer to them as performance bond. Performance bond or margin is an initial deposit similar to a security deposit that you must put up when you initiate a contract. Remember, let's think back to the definition of the contract. When you buy a futures contract, you're agreeing to take delivery of an underlying asset for a fixed price. Let's say that I enter into a contract with oil, and for the sake of this example, let's say oil right now is trading at $100 a barrel, and I decide to buy five contracts. Each contract is for 1,000 barrels, so if I buy five contracts, that's 5,000 barrels of oil at $100 a barrel. Now let's say that before expiration, the oil market just collapses, and oil's trading at $40 at expiration. Because my futures contract is an obligation, now I'm obligated to go out and buy 5,000 barrels of oil at $100 a barrel, and that oil is only worth $40 a barrel. I'm going to take a huge loss. One thing I might think about doing is just backing out of the contract. And so if I back out of the contract, whoever's on the other side is going to take a big loss. Well, one of the roles of the exchange, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, Chicago Board of Trade, New York Mercantile Exchange, and as a side note, the Chicago Board of Trade and New York Mercantile Exchange are both owned by the CME group at this point. So they're all basically the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. But primary role of the exchange is to guarantee that whoever is on the receiving end of a contract is going to get what they're paid. I don't want to buy a futures contract if there's a chance that somebody on the other side might default. So the exchange guarantees that I'm going to get paid. One way they do that is through the use of these margins. Because the buyer on the other side has to set up an initial deposit, initially if that buyer loses money, that's going to come from their security deposit so that the exchange is going to have money to pay me off on my side of the contract. So one of the things to keep in mind when we have a futures contract is that the exchange is kind of a middleman. We have the buyer of the contract over here and the seller of the contract here. Well, the exchange guarantees that whoever wins in this contract, whether it's the buyer or the seller, they're going to get paid. So if prices drop, the seller is going to make a profit and the exchange is going to guarantee that they get paid. If prices go up, the buyer is going to make a profit. The exchange is going to guarantee that they get paid. They do this through the use of performance bonds. Now, I mentioned that the performance bond is similar to a security deposit, kind of a good faith deposit that you put in up front to back up your position. But what happens if you lose more than that initial security deposit? For example, when I mentioned my oil situation, I lost $60 a barrel on 5000 barrels. My initial margin probably was quite a bit less than my loss. So in order for the exchange to guarantee that there's always money there to pay off either side, contracts are marked to market on a daily basis. What we mean by that is whenever your position gains value, money is added to your margin account at the end of that day. When your position loses value, money is subtracted from your margin account 
at the end of the day. So mark to market ensures that there's always money in your margin account because as you lose money you might run into falling below your maintenance margin. If you fall below your maintenance margin you have to put more money in to bring it back up to the initial margin. The initial margin was that security deposit or good faith deposit that you initially put in. Now, the easiest way to see this is to walk through an example. So let's do an example with a corn contract. Corn contracts are for 5,000 bushels and they're priced in cents per bushel. Now when I made up this example, the current price of corn was 757. Remember that's in cents, so 757 actually works out to be $7.57 per bushel. Each contract is for 5,000 bushels. So the value of a contract is equal to 5,000 bushels times $7.57 per bushel or $37,850. If I buy a contract, I'm essentially buying $37,850 worth of corn. If I sell a contract, I'm agreeing to deliver $37,850 worth of corn. So this is the value of the contract that I'm buying or selling in the financial markets when I buy or sell a futures contract. However, even though the contract is valued at $37,850, I only have to put up an initial margin of $2,363. Now those margins vary every quarter. The exchanges update the margins based on the value of the contract and how volatile the contract is. So these are the margins in place on the day I make the video. By the time you're watching this, the margins might be a little bit different. Again, these margins are updated every quarter based on the value of the underlying contract and the volatility of the contract. This is the initial amount that we have to put up if we want to buy a contract or if we initially short or write a contract. Either way, agreeing to deliver, being short, or agreeing to take delivery, being long, we're going to have to initiate our contract with $2,363 per contract in an initial margin. That's going to allow us to control a contract valued at $37,850. Maintenance margin is $1,750. What that means is the exchange says if our margin account drops below $1,750, we need to put more in and bring that back up to the initial margin of $2,363. Now one of the appeals to futures contracts is the leverage. Because you only put in an initial margin and you're controlling a much bigger value of the underlying asset, you have tremendous leverage. In the example of corn, we have 16 to 1 leverage factor. For every 1 cent, the or for every 1% the underlying asset moves, 1% change in the corn price, I earn a 16% return on my investment. Now if I'm long that contract and corn goes up by 1%, I earn a 16% return. On the other hand, if corn goes down by 1%, I lose 16% of my initial investment. So futures, one of the reasons you see here so often that futures are very risky, it's because of the leverage impact. Typically, we only put up a small amount of the value that we're controlling, and that gives us tremendous leverage. We might require more margin when we dip below the maintenance margin. So if you look, the difference between the initial margin and maintenance margin is $613, 5,000 bushels. So if corn drops by 12 and a quarter, per, or 12 and a quarter cents, then I'm going to have to add more margin to my account and bring it back up to the $2,363.